transport locally. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And could I begin by recognising the incredible achievement of Rangers Football Club last night in Seville, reaching the Europa League final. It was a significant achievement for the club, but also for Scottish football. And for 120 minutes, uh, the two teams could not be separated. Uh, and I know for clubs, it's difficult to lose any match on penalties. But to lose a major European final on penalties will be particularly hard to take. However, I think this Parliament can agree that Rangers did Scottish football proud last night in Seville. When Nicola Sturgeon's government took over the running of Scotland's railways just last month, the First Minister promised that passenger services would be efficient, sustainable, fit for the future. But in just seven weeks since the SNP took control, passengers have faced chaos and disruption. Every day, hundreds of services have been cancelled, often at the very last minute. First Minister, will you apologise to the thousands of passengers here we go, the SNP members say. Here we go. Well, yes, here we go. First Minister. First Minister, will you apologise to the thousands of passengers who have faced this disruption since the SNP took control of Scotland Railways? First Minister. Presiding officer, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to address the real issue, and I will come on to that uh, directly in a second. Let me, though, firstly also take the opportunity to pay tribute to Rangers Football Club. Uh, the result last night was heartbreaking for the team and for their many, uh, many fans. Uh, but the uh, achievement of getting to the final was considerable. They played extremely well last night. It was a gutsy performance. So despite the disappointment, I know the team, uh, everybody associated with the team and the many fans in Seville and watching uh, across Scotland uh, will feel today, uh, they should also feel extremely proud of their team. Uh, they did Scottish football and Scotland proud last night, and I send them my congratulations for that achievement. Um, let me turn now to the important issue of uh, real services, and I do appreciate the opportunity to address this issue, which is of significant concern uh, to real passengers. And let me just say at the outset, uh, I always express uh, apologies to anybody, whether on uh, our rail services or in any other public services, that are not uh, getting the standard of service that they deserve. Uh, ScotRail has taken the decision to put in place a temporary timetable that has been made necessary by the decision of some drivers not to take up the option of overtime Sunday and rest day working as part of a pay dispute. Uh, ScotRail considered uh, that issue and in consultation with Transport Focus, which is the organisation that represents passengers, uh, decided that a temporary timetable was preferable to unplanned cancellations. Uh, however, let me stress this point uh, and let me make this point very strongly. It is vital to get uh, the timetable back to normal as quickly as possible, and I expect ScotRail to review the temporary arrangements regularly. Indeed, uh, it is due to be formally reviewed on the 3rd of June. And I think there are two points uh, that are material in that regard. Firstly, it is important to seek to reach an agreement on pay a fair agreement on pay as quickly as possible. Uh, train drivers uh, right now before overtime earn around £50,000 a year. Uh, notwithstanding that, this is a tough time uh, for everyone, so everybody wants to see a fair pay award, but of course all pay awards uh, do require to be affordable. Uh, and secondly, ScotRail continues to reduce the need for rest day working through training new drivers. The training programme was interrupted by COVID, but a significant number of new drivers uh, are currently going through uh, training. Uh, so I expect ScotRail uh, to make sure that this temporary timetable is just that, temporary, uh, and the timetable gets back to normal as quickly as possible. And of course, I will ask the Transport Minister to ensure that MSPs uh, are kept fully up to date. Douglas Ross. The First Minister said twice that she appreciated the opportunity to update the Chamber on the ScotRail issue, but it seems she did not appreciate the opportunity to say sorry. Those words did not come out of the First Minister's mouth. She mentioned about – well, actually, I, I did listen – and the First Minister said she will take opportunities to apologise, and then she did not. 
and passengers deserve an apology because it's not just the cuts they have seen up until now. From next week, there will be even more. 700 services lost every day. Almost a third will disappear. And on some lines, it gets even worse. Services from Glasgow to Dumfries are being halved. It's the same on the Edinburgh to Tweedbank line. Dunbar station goes from 11 ScotRail services every day to zero. None. ScotRail passengers will be left with a reduced timetable or no trains at all. Yesterday, the SNP's Transport Minister couldn't give passengers any guarantee about when these cancellations will end. And it's no wonder. Kevin Lindsay of the Train Drivers Union, ASLEF, said this on Monday of the Scottish Government's role in settling this dispute. This is a direct quote from the Union. Quite frankly, it is the worst negotiations I have been part of in 30 years as a Union representative. First Minister, with such terrible handling of the negotiations by your Government, just when can passengers expect normal service to resume? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Douglas Ross uh, decides what he wants uh, to hear and what he doesn't want to hear uh, often. I think the problem, though, for him is that other people are listening to my answers uh, as well. Uh, so I started my answer by saying I always take the opportunity to apologise to any member of the public in Scotland uh, who doesn't get from a public service, whether that is the railway or any other public service, uh, the standard of service uh, they have a right to expect. Um, and that includes uh, those who are being disrupted right now because of the temporary timetable being put in place uh, by uh, ScotRail. Um, secondly, uh, the services uh, that uh, are affected, as I said, this is a temporary timetable. I would expect the timetable to return to normal as quickly as possible, and that expectation is being made very, very clear uh, to ScotRail. I have set out uh, the requirements that we need to see progressed. Firstly, progress towards a fair but also affordable pay settlement for rail workers. Um, but secondly, ScotRail continuing to progress the training of additional drivers uh, so that reliance on rest day working uh, can be reduced uh, and I hope eventually eliminated. It is worth pointing out, of course, uh, that we did uh, last year negotiate and agree with ASLEF an extension to the rest day working arrangements. Uh, they are in place until October 2022. So it is disappointing uh, to see them being affected in this way, but notwithstanding uh, that, ScotRail is focusing on the steps that need to be taken. Uh, so I want to see services back to normal uh, just as quickly as possible, and the government will be doing everything uh, we possibly can to bring about that outcome. Douglas Ross. Of course, these cuts are not just going to affect passengers, but they are devastating for businesses mm -hmm. as well. Businesses in our city centres that are still reeling from the impact of the COVID pandemic are now facing another lost summer. In so many places across Scotland, people are not going to be able to get a train to use it after a night out. The Chief Operating Officer of ScotRail said yesterday, before the latest cuts were announced, that protecting the first and the last services was an absolute priority. That's a quote from the Chief Operating Officer. But that clearly has not happened. Take just one example. From Edinburgh to the Deputy First Minister's constituency in Perth. You won't have to leave an hour earlier, not two hours earlier, but more than three hours earlier. The last train from Edinburgh to Perth is now going to be at 8 o'clock instead of 18 minutes past 11 at night. And, presiding officer, that's just one example. On train services right across Scotland, the last train is being brought forward by hours. And this will have a profound impact on businesses, restaurants, bars and clubs. Uh, and this is a quote from the Nighttime Industries Association just this morning, who have called the cuts to these services, and I quote, another cruel blow. They go on to say that it will put at risk both Scotland's economic recovery and the future of many thousands of small businesses and jobs. First Minister, what compensation is your government going to provide to the businesses who are clearly going to be affected by these cuts? First Minister. Well, presiding officer, it is very clear, um, and I absolutely accept, that these temporary cancellations, uh, which are being made necessary by a pay dispute, are disruptive. They are disruptive to individuals, and they are disruptive 
to businesses. That is why it is so important uh, that I stress today and that ScotRail works hard to ensure that the temporary timetable is just that, that it is a temporary one and that normal service is resumed as quickly as possible. And that is the focus of ScotRail and the government will do everything uh, we can uh, to support that outcome. Um, it is also important to note that this temporary timetable, while it, of course it is regrettable that it is necessary, is designed to give more certainty to passengers for uh, the short term, rather than have what we saw at the weekend, which was unplanned cancellations. Uh, so it is disruptive. It is not acceptable. It must get back to normal as quickly as possible. That is why we must see uh, all parties get round the table and negotiate a fair and an affordable uh, pay deal, but also that ScotRail must continue the work that it is already undertaking to train more drivers. There are uh, already uh, more drivers uh, working for ScotRail than was the case in, in many previous years, but to train more drivers so that that reliance on rest day working is reduced and eventually eliminated. So that's the focus of ScotRail. Uh, that's the focus on government. But I would say to the unions uh, as well, I understand uh, their job to represent uh, their members and to get a fair pay deal for members. Uh, but let's uh, see uh, both parties get round the table uh, and negotiate that in good faith. Uh, I think that's what the travelling public would want to see as well. Douglas Ross. First Minister, you call this regrettable. Say that to the people in Dunbar who will have zero trains operated by ScotRail stopping at their station. Say that to the business leaders who are telling you right now these cuts are going to put at risk thousands of jobs and small businesses. And let's remember Nicola Sturgeon and her government are in charge of Scotland's yeah. railways. Yes. Just last month at Queen Street Station, the First Minister proclaimed that nationalising ScotRail was a new beginning, that it would deliver a railway for the nation. Yet passengers are now paying more than ever in fares and getting the worst service anyone has seen for a generation. Seven weeks into nationalisation, it's already proving a disaster. Mm. Just like the ferries, as soon as this government steps in to try and sort things out, problems get even worse. Yeah. The SNP took over running of our rail service on April Fool's Day. But NatRail is no joke for Scotland's passengers. Next week, we'll see 700 fewer services across the country every day. Next week, 700 fewer services across the country every day. First Minister, was this really your grand vision for the railway in Scotland under SNP control? First Minister. I think, I think public ownership of the railway uh, is uh, the right arrangement to have in place. And I do think it uh, gives us the ability to ensure uh, over the long term that we see real improvements in our railways. Uh, but make no uh, bones about it, whether uh, the railway was in public hands or, or still in private hands, Douglas Ross, rightly and properly, would be asking me these questions uh, today, because these are matters of significant importance uh, to people across uh, the country. And of course, it was to individuals and businesses that I was directing my comments in my earlier answer. Uh, on the issue of fares, uh, of course, uh, one of the benefits we do want to realise uh, is affordable fares. But fares in Scotland, uh, let's not forget, are already, on average, 20 per cent cheaper than they are where Douglas Ross' party is in government. And on the issue of the temporary timetable, it is temporary. Uh, it has proven necessary because of the dispute. I want to see that dispute settled as soon as possible. And ScotRail continue to take the action to reduce reliance on rest day working. Uh, that's what it is right that ScotRail focuses on. Um, it needs to see uh, the unions back round the table negotiating on pay, and I hope that uh, is the case as well. So we will continue to focus, yes, on these short-term challenges, uh, which are there uh, and which are regrettable for those who use our railways. Uh, so we will focus on these short-term challenges, but we will also focus on building the longer-term improvements to our railway services that people across the country do want to see. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by joining others in recognising the tremendous effort of Rangers Football Club? And while the loss on penalties will hurt, they, their staff, their players, the management should be incredibly proud of the phenomenal journey they took the club on. It was a fantastic advert for Glasgow, for Scotland and for Scottish football. President Officer, last month, after years of labour campaigning, Scotland was brought into public ownership and what Nicola Sturgeon described as a historic moment. 
Can I ask the First Minister if making the biggest cuts to railways in over half a century was what she had in mind? First Minister. Well, uh, Anna Sarwar says years of Labour uh, campaigning. Of course, uh, before that, there was years of Labour government at Westminster that failed to bring the railways uh, back into public ownership. Uh, and also opposed the devolution of network uh, rail. But back on to, uh, I think, the more serious issue. Uh, this is a temporary timetable. Um, I wish it didn't have to be put in place. It has been put in place in consultation with Transport Focus uh, to give greater certainty rather than have unplanned cancellations for a short, I hope, period of time uh, that uh, those revised services have to be in place. I've already set out in my answers uh, the work that needs to be done, uh, the developments we need to see both on pay and on training more drivers uh, to ensure that as quickly as possible these services get back to normal. That's the focus of me, it's the focus of the Transport Minister, the Government and of ScotRail. Anna Sarwar. The Minister wants to talk about what was happening when I was at school, not what was happening in the 15 years she's been in government here in uh, Scotland. <laughs> The reality is there is no industrial action, and what she's talking about is relying on the goodwill of staff to work on their rest days to keep Scotland's railways going. So let's look at the facts and the reality facing Scotland's passengers. At the start of 2020, there were 2,400 services a day. In the timetable announced in February, approved by the Scottish Government, that number had reduced to 2,150, a cut of 250. Now, the new timetable announced yesterday by the Scottish Government owned by ScotRail, that number has reduced to 1,456 services a day, a cut of almost 1,000 services compared to the start of 2020. Yeah. At the same time, the Scottish Government announced an increase in rail fares in the midst of a cost of living crisis when fuel prices are spiralling. In 2018, Nicola Sturgeon described uh, cancellations of up to 144 a day as unacceptable and, cuts of, and cancellations of 40 a day as not good enough. She said, and I quote, we expect, indeed we demand, better from the rail operator. Well, for once, Nicola Sturgeon has got nobody else to blame. Why are 40 cuts a day when someone else is in charge not good enough, but cutting 1,000 services a day, in the words of the rail minister, a stable and reliable service? First Minister. Of course, Anna Sarwar is... Uh possibly deliberately uh, mixing up different things, and I'll come on to, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, no, but it, but, it, but it is important. Uh, firstly, as I, as I believe the record will show, Presiding Officer, I haven't said there is industrial action, there haven't been ballots for industrial action, and I hope there is not industrial action. But there is a pay dispute. Yep. As Lev has said, it is in dispute with Scott Rail, uh, and drivers are therefore, some drivers, are not accepting overtime Sunday and rest day working. So that is a matter of fact. He is right to say, and I've said it several times already today, that we don't want ScotRail to be in a position of having to rely on rest day working. We came to an agreement, ScotRail came to an agreement with the rail unions last year, in October last year, to extend these arrangements until October this year. But there is a training programme underway to train new drivers to reduce the reliance on rest day working. It was interrupted because of COVID, but it is back underway and there will be significant numbers of drivers coming through that training programme. Uh, turning now to services, the change to services uh, in February, uh, yes, I know they are controversial and I know members in this chamber uh, have spoken out against them, but these were changes that were to take account of uh, changes to travel patterns uh, that have come about uh, due to COVID and, and people's different ways of working. Uh, the services uh, that we are talking about now are a temporary yeah. change, uh, a temporary timetable until uh, we get over, till ScotRail gets over this short-term challenge. And I've set out today the steps it needs to take, both around pay and negotiating with the unions a fair pay settlement and also continuing that work uh, to train more drivers. Uh, what has been announced is a temporary timetable uh, and I expect it to be temporary so that those services are back to normal as quickly as possible. Anna Sarwar. President Officer, Scotland celebrated the railways coming into public ownership, something Labour championed and continued to support. But already due to SNP and governance, and I'll remind SNP members, repeatedly you voted against nationalisation of our railways. But already, due to SNP incompetence, a thousand services cut a day. Proposals to shut booking offices, rail fares up, 
have refused to rule out compulsory redundancies and industrial relations at an all-time low. Yet again, the SNP chased the headline but won't do the work. Maybe they should employ, maybe they should employ fewer spin doctors and more train drivers. On the same weekend, the Nicola Sturgeon jetted over to the US to talk about climate change. The SNP Green government cut rail services, the greenest form of transport here at home. And while she rightly demands action on the cost of living across the UK, she ignores the impact of decisions she makes right here in Scotland. The cost of commuting going up, people struggling to get to work, unable to get home at night, and whole communities cut off from our cities. Why do the people of Scotland continually have to pay the price of SNP failure? First Minister. Chasing headlines, uh, presiding officer. Could that, could that be like, I don't know, perhaps saying in a council election that there'll be no coalitions yeah. and then doing backroom deals yeah. with the Tories after the council elections? Could that be what Anna Sarwar talking about? How colleagues. dare? First Minister, First Minister. First Minister, there will be no conversations across aisles. No loud conversations. Thank you. First I Minister. I dare Anna come to this chamber and talk about the cost of living when his party is seeking to do backroom deals with the authors of that cost of living <laughs> crisis. <laughs> Secondly, presiding officer, it's one thing for Labour to say they have, let me quote, championed at the renationalisation of ScotRail, supported the renationalisation of ScotRail. Unfortunately, they didn't do anything about it when they had the opportunity in government. Uh, so this government uh, has renationalised ScotRail. Uh, yes, there are challenges in that, uh, and we are doing the work to address those challenges, both in the short term, in the way I have set out. People who use the railway across our country have a right to expect uh, that, but we will continue to work with ScotRail to overcome these immediate challenges and then build that better railway for the future. Uh, that is what being in government is all about. Uh, and on previous performance, Anna Sarwar is still some considerable way from that. Thank you. We will now move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Alistair Allen. <clears throat> on Tuesday, the UK Government announced its intention to make unilateral changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol, putting the UK in breach of international treaty obligations and threatening a full-scale trade war with the EU while people are suffering a cost-of-living crisis. Given that many businesses have warned of the damage this could do to Scottish exporters, does the First Minister agree that this shows there is no group of people or sector of the economy that this Tory government isn't willing to sacrifice on the altar of Brexit? First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I do agree with that. The announcement this week from the UK Government that it is intending to legislate to enable unilateral action to override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol is deeply concerning. To breach an international treaty signed in good faith, hailed by the Prime Minister at the time as a fantastic uh, deal, is bad enough. Uh, but it could trigger a trade war with the European Union, and that would have profound implications uh, for Scotland's economy, as well as the economies of other parts of the UK. And I think to contemplate that action at any time uh, would be bad, uh, but to do so uh, when people across the UK are facing an acute cost of living crisis is unthinkable and indefensible. So I would urge the UK Government to pull back and focus instead on dialogue with EU partners uh, and to find durable, agreed solutions uh, that won't heap even more misery onto individuals and businesses across the country. Douglas Lumsden. Um, President officer, in yesterday's press and journal, it was reported that teachers at Aberdeenshire Council had sent degrading WhatsApp messages about pupils with additional support needs. The parents of the pupils involved have asked for greater transparency on what was shared, but so far have nothing. Will the First Minister join me in condemning this behaviour? And can I ask if she will do everything she can to ensure the parents of the children involved have full access to the messages and the Council simply do not just brush this under the carpet? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me take the opportunity to say that uh, anyone who sends degrading messages about children uh, with disabilities uh, deserves utter condemnation. That is completely uh, and utterly unacceptable. And I completely understand the concerns of uh, parents and young people concerned. Uh, obviously, this is first and foremost a matter for the Council as, as employer, and it's important that I don't see anything 
uh, that might undermine any process that is underway. But I do absolutely understand the desire of parents uh, for full transparency, uh, and I hope the Council will take full note of that. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, given the worries that we won't even see a 90 per cent completion rate for this year's delayed census, in addition to encouraging people to fill in the form if they haven't yet done so, would you agree that we need an inquiry into what went wrong, given the millions wasted, the issues of safety and pressures put on frontline staff, and the importance of the census in allocating resources and tackling inequalities? First Minister. Uh, I think it is well understood, and uh, Angus Robertson has set these factors uh, out to the Chamber, uh, why there have been these uh, challenges in terms of the completion rate. But work continues. Uh, I uh, and uh, the Cabinet Secretary get uh, daily uh, updates uh, right now uh, on the numbers of people returning their census, and numbers are going up, uh, and there will be no let-up in those efforts uh, over uh, the remainder of this month. Uh, after uh, that date has passed, there will be a couple of things, uh, no doubt more than that, but a couple I want to mention uh, today that we need to look at. Firstly, uh, the work to ensure, uh, which happens with all census, censuses, that it is a credible uh, exercise and the information from it is uh, reliable. And I, I think it will be appropriate to take uh, expert advice on that. And yes, secondly, to make sure, as we would after any exercise of this nature, that all appropriate lessons are learned and that we do that in the best possible way. Question number three, Morris Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Oh, that's it. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is supporting households, communities and businesses to take part in the big plastic count. First Minister. It is good that people across the country are helping uh, to draw awareness to plastic waste as part of the big plastic count. It is important to lead by example and make our actions count in tackling plastic waste. That is why we have laid regulations before Parliament that ban some of the most problematic single-use plastic products. It is why we are bringing in the deposit return scheme from August next year and why we are introducing extended producer responsibility for packaging. These measures will help transition Scotland to a circular economy and significantly reduce the impact of single-use plastic on the environment. Maurice Golden. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The big plastic count is an opportunity to better understand the scale of plastic pollution in Scotland. What we do know is that just 2% of plastic waste collected for recycling in Scotland is actually recycled here. That is why I have long called for a new plastic recycling centre, ideally in Dundee. In November, the First Minister agreed to consider supporting it. So can the First Minister provide an update on what progress has been made and what locations are being considered? First Minister. I will ask the Minister uh, to send a, a detailed update on that specific point. Uh, but I do agree with the Member on the importance of this issue and of taking uh, action on uh, reducing plastic waste. Uh, if I look at recycling rates, for example, uh, we saw in 2019 waste and resources sector emissions uh, in Scotland over 30 per cent lower than in 2011, 73% uh, percent lower than in 1998. But there is much more work to do, which is why all of the actions I set out in my original answer are so important. I hope, in fact, I believe there is uh, a considerable amount of consensus across the chamber, both on the need to do this uh, and on the specific measures uh, we are taking. And we will continue to ensure that our efforts uh, are commensurate with the scale of the challenge. Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support the health and wellbeing of the NHS workforce. First Minister. Our new national workforce strategy highlights the key priority of uh, the well-being of the health and social care workforce, uh, wherever they work. Uh, we made £12 million available in the last financial year to support the mental health and well-being of the workforce. To complement the help available at local level, we also have a range of resources, including the National Wellbeing Hub, a 24-7 National Wellbeing Helpline, confidential mental health treatment through the Workforce Specialist Service and funding for additional local psychological support. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that answer and remind Chamber I am a registered nurse. Um, our NHS workforce in Scotland have been at the forefront of the response to the pandemic and have shown their personal dedication, resilience and ability to adapt to, the, to meet the demands of changing healthcare. The support the First Minister outlined is very welcome. 
will she commit the government to continue to work with our NHS teams to ensure that support is person-centred, responds to the needs of the workforce, and that funding will remain in place to promote positive health and wellbeing? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I will give those commitments. Uh, every single person working in health and social care has been part of uh, an incredible response uh, during the pandemic, uh, helping to protect the country and save lives throughout the most significant challenge that our health and social care services have ever faced. Uh, but that has taken its toll uh, on those who work in health and social care. So we will continue to work with leaders across uh, health and social care, as well as hearing directly from staff, to understand uh, exactly where the current pressures are and what further actions can be taken to mitigate uh, the impact on staff. Uh, we will only overcome the challenges ahead if we look after our most valuable asset, which is the people who provide care for us. And ultimately, we are seeking to embed wellbeing so that it becomes part uh, of everyone's working lives. Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, tragically last year, two overworked Glasgow medics working in our NHS took their own lives. And this week, the chair of the BMA's Scottish Junior Doctors Committee warned that overstretched medics will be killed due to extreme pressures and workloads that NHS staff are having to cope with. Let me ask the First Minister two questions. First, does the First Minister recognise that current ways of working are risking lives? And secondly, when can we expect the Scottish Government to finally implement the safe staffing legislation passed unanimously by this Parliament three years ago? First Minister. Well, firstly, I uh, want to convey my deepest condolences uh, to anyone who has lost a loved one uh, to suicide. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, individual circumstances, obviously, uh, but uh, my thoughts uh, are with any family in that circumstance. Um, it is really important that we continue to work to ensure that uh, the mental health toll of the pandemic and of working in health and social care generally uh, is properly understood and that services are put in place uh, for those who work in these services, uh, whatever specific job it is that they do. The well-being of junior doctors is a key priority. No member of staff should feel obliged to work over their hours, and I expect NHS boards to have systems in place to manage this and ensure that staff do not work excess Hours, and that includes abolishing junior doctors working for seven uh, night shifts in a row and ensuring uh, that no junior doctor works uh, more than seven consecutive shifts. In terms of the safe staffing uh, legislation, it is important that we have uh, legislated in that way and we are now working uh, with NHS boards uh, to ensure that that is fully implemented in a safe and sustainable way. Uh, the last point I would make, which is not intended uh, to take away from the challenges uh, that healthcare staff uh, do face every single day, is that there are record numbers uh, of people working in our National Health Service, and it is important that we continue to support them in the vital job that they do. Carol Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Unison Trade Union have contacted me to say that the workplace pressures in NHS borders have led staff to report to the union issues such as dangerous staffing levels for both patients and staff, staff not receiving proper rest breaks, staff not being op given opportunities to report serious incidents on Datex, the NHS electronic incident reporting system and serious breaches of health and safety regulations. First Minister, these undoubtedly impact on the mental health and well-being of the NHS workforce. Will the First Minister intervene to support them? And will that support include the full implementation of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act, working closely with the trade unions to ensure the staff safety and well-being? First Minister. We work every day with all NHS boards uh, to support staff, uh, and that includes NHS borders, uh, and that work has been monitoring workforce capacity and providing intervention uh, where appropriate. Uh, unplanned absence has reduced in recent weeks, and we're seeing some improvement in workforce capacity uh, in NHS borders. Uh, nevertheless, there does remain significant demand-led pressure across the NHS as services recover and remobilise from the pandemic. So the government will continue to do everything possible uh, to work with NHS boards to support recovery, staffing capacity and staff wellbeing. And the National Health and Social Care Workforce Strategy, which was published recently, uh, sets out exactly how we will support recovery, uh, growth and transformation across the National Health Service. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. 
to ask the First Minister what her response is to recent reports estimating that around 10,000 people with advanced dementia are paying over 50 million a year to cover their residential social care costs. First Minister. The Scottish Government recognises the important role of residential care in meeting the complex care needs of those at the more advanced stages of dementia. Uh, over the past two years, we have increased the free personal and nursing care uh, weekly payment rates by more than 18 per cent. Uh, free personal and nursing care is available to adults of any age, no matter their condition, capital or income, who are assessed by the local authority as needing it. Uh, for those self-funding in a care home, payments uh, will normally be made directly by the local authority to the care home operator as a contribution towards care home fees. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response, but it does not cover the specific issue I am raising with her, because the First Minister will be aware of a report three years ago about care for people with advanced dementia from a working group led by former First Minister Henry McLeish. But little action has been taken forward on one of the key recommendations. We know that people with ad advanced dementia are having their health care needs classified as social care and wrongly being asked to pay over £50 million. If they were designated as healthcare, they would be treated free at the point of need. So will the First Minister act now to ensure that this unfair and unjustifiable approach is changed so people with advanced dementia are treated with equity and fairness and classed as having healthcare needs? First Minister. I will, of course, uh, look into these matters uh, and uh, specifically the suggestion that people's care needs uh, are being wrongly uh, designated. Um, that is uh, a point I uh, recognise is important. Um, on the issue more generally, and Henry McLeish, of course, was uh, the First Minister, if memory serves me correctly, who introduced uh, free personal care in the first uh, instance. Uh, back then, and Jackie Bailey will remember this, uh, that debate recognised uh, the fact that it was reasonable uh, for people uh, to pay their uh, accommodation part. Uh, Jackie Bailey, I'm coming on to the, the point, part of their accommodation cost, because uh, not to do so would lead to an inequity between uh, those in care homes and those receiving care at home, who still, of course, have to pay for their own accommodation. Uh, so that uh, is what lies behind the development of the fee uh, personal and nursing care policy. But it is important that people's care needs uh, are properly assessed and categorised. Um, and if the suggestion is that is not happening um, and people therefore are paying money that under the current policy they shouldn't be paying, then yes, uh, I will ensure that that is looked at um, and the Health Secretary uh, will respond in more detail once we've had the opportunity to do so. Question number six, Mark Rusko. To ask the First Minister what further talks the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government about future oil and gas fields off the coast of Scotland. First Minister. The recent scientific reports from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have made very clear that the global climate emergency hasn't gone away and that the window to act to limit warming to 1.5 degrees is rapidly closing. Uh, the Scottish Government has made our position clear to the UK Government that to support our just transition to net zero, new offshore oil and gas licences should be subject to a stringent climate compatibility checkpoint. Uh, this should extend beyond new licensing rounds to also cover fields that are already consented but not yet in production. Uh, indeed, the need for this is supported by the UK Government's own independent advisers in the UK Committee on Climate Change. We responded formally to the UK Government consultation earlier this year but have not yet seen any further detail on the proposed checkpoint. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Energy restated our position uh, to UK Ministers on publication of the UK Government's energy security strategy on the 18th of March. Mark Kruskal. Can I thank the First Minister for that very crystal clear response? Six months on from COP26, hundreds of new fossil fuel projects have been proposed globally that, if realised, will cause our mutually assured destruction from climate change. The European Union know this. That's why they're backing renewables through a new multi-billion pound investment. In contrast, the UK Government Minister Kwasi Kwarteng is fueling the rush to climate breakdown by relabeling dirty gas as green in an attempt to fast-track developments like Jackdaw. Does the First Minister agree that the best way to slash energy bills is to replace gas with renewables and that the best way to isolate Putin is to insulate homes? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I, I do agree with uh, the sentiment um, and indeed uh, the substance of that question. It is important, uh, notwithstanding the short-term challenges and uh, inevitable volatilities that have been caused by 
uh, Russia's uh, despicable invasion of Ukraine. All of our decisions must be consistent uh, with that journey to net zero, which is so uh, necessary to safeguard the future of the planet. Uh, and we must continue and not allow to go into reverse the progress that was made at COP26. I was uh, discussing this very issue with the United States uh, Climate Envoy John Kerry earlier uh, this week. And I think there is a recognition uh, there, as there is here, that that momentum must continue. The way to ensure energy security um, and also lower energy prices, as well as to safeguard the planet, is to make that shift to renewable and low-carbon sources of energy. And we can illustrate that right now in Scotland uh, by the fact that already in our energy mix, the cheapest form of power is wind power. Uh, so it's those investments in renewables that we must focus on, because the entire world, for the sake of the future of the planet, must ensure that the transition happens and that it accelerates rather than slows down. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister not, however, recognise that domestic oil and gas projects can help reduce energy prices, secure energy security, secure thousands of jobs through a fair transition, and has a lower carbon footprint than imported supplies, thus actually progressing our journey to net zero? First Minister. Well, I have spent much of this week uh, making the point uh, that the invasion of Ukraine uh, does create short-term uh, challenges uh, that will lead to short-term decisions, but it must not take away our focus on the long-term imperative. Uh, nobody wants to see uh, the UK become more reliant uh, on imports, and I have said that in this chamber as well as uh, in other places. Uh, but it does remain the case uh, that the way to accelerate the transition to net zero, uh, which is important, as I say, not just for environmental imperatives, but also to increase energy security um, and to reduce energy costs, is not in the long term simply to replace one source of oil and gas uh, with another source of oil and gas. It is to move away from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy. And actually, the oil and gas companies recognise that too, which is why so many of them now are investing themselves in renewable energy. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. After COP26, I asked the First Minister in this chamber if uh, Campbell should go ahead, and she rightly said that it should not get the green light. Mark Ruskell is right to say we need crystal clear language and positions. Can I ask, in terms of Jack Daw, ahead of tomorrow's Digital Day of Action, is it also the First Minister's position that Jack Daw should not get the green light? First Minister. Um, I think Mark Rusko, and he will correct me if I'm misquoting him here, said my answer was crystal clear. Um, I am very clear, and I've said it again today, that any uh, new development, uh, whether that is a new licensing round uh, or already consented developments uh, that are looking for the go-ahead, have to have a robust climate compatibility checkpoint, and in the absence of that, it shouldn't uh, go ahead. So that is uh, very clear. If Monica Lennon though, wants me to have greater um, ability to influence these things, then perhaps she will support these powers actually being transferred from the UK government, where they currently lie, to this government and this parliament. Question number seven, Graham Simpson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to prevent future rail service cancellations due to industrial action by drivers. First Minister. I set out at length earlier on. Uh, we are supporting ScotRail uh, to negotiate a fair pay settlement uh, with trade unions, uh, but also to train more drivers to reduce reliance on rest day working. Uh, the service cancellations uh, referred to are temporary. The timetable uh, change is temporary. Um, and my focus, the government's focus and ScotRail's focus, is getting it back to normal as quickly as possible. Graham Simpson. When NatRail launched on April Fool's Day, I speculated that things... I speculated, presiding officer, that things might not go perfectly. What I... Members, members, we will hear Graham Simpson. Thank you. They don't, they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth, presiding officer. Because what I, what I did not realise was that wrecking the country's train service would become established government policy. Now, Nicola Sturgeon says she wants to get everyone round the table. That should include her own Transport Minister, Jenny Gilruth, who has been posted missing in all this. And that is, why, that is why the unions are so exasperated. Well, 
the First Minister should speak to the unions like I have been doing, and she would hear the same thing. Members, members, we will hear Mr Simpson. Thank you. Look, I know, I know this is uncomfortable for them, but we're running a railway that is completely reliant on people working on their days off. That is completely crazy. Now, the First Minister says she wants this timetable to be temporary. But let me put this to her. It takes 18 months to train a driver, and we've got 130 to get through the system. So will the First Minister admit that it could take until at least 2024 before ScotRail is off this emergency timetable? First Minister. No, I, I, I don't accept that. Um... Firstly, let me uh, welcome uh, the Tory recognition for uh, the importance of trade unions. Not something we often hear. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny Gilruth, Jenny Gilruth uh, has met and uh, talked regularly to trade unions, and will continue uh, to do so. And we will continue uh, to support in all uh, possible ways uh, the resolution of the issues that allow the timetable to get back to normal. On the issue of uh, drivers, though. Uh, ScotRail uh, hopes that actually an additional 38 drivers will be trained by the end of the summer, rising to 55 uh, by the end of the year uh, and to uh, 100 uh, after that. So that is the work that is underway. Uh, and perhaps if uh, Graeme Simpson spent more time uh, borrowing the slogans uh, of his leader that had already been used and actually engaging in the substance, uh, we might uh, have better exchanges. And Fiona Hislop. I know that the First Minister appreciates the severe disruption affecting everyone involved, including those in my constituency of Linlithgow, where passengers were just coming back in strength to travel by train. South of the border, the UK Government is pursuing a dispute with the rail unions for what can only be described as political and ideological purposes. Does the First Minister share my concern that events elsewhere in the UK are souring industrial relations here in Scotland? And affecting members, does the First Minister share my concern that events elsewhere in the UK are souring industrial relations here in Scotland and affecting the new beginning of public ownership of Scotland's railway? First Minister. Well, it's not surprising that the Conservatives uh, don't want to hear this. It's more surprising that Labour don't appear to want to hear this. The situation in Scotland is the responsibility of ScotRail, which of course is now a publicly owned company, so therefore my responsibility and the uh, responsibility of the government. Uh, but the Conservatives should be aware that there is a separate uh, RMT dispute right now with Network Rail and with uh, UK DFT operators. Uh, that is a reserve matter, but if it is not resolved, it will also have an impact on services here in Scotland. So perhaps some advice uh, to their own party uh, as well might not go amiss. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is members' business.